This call is now being recorded. Uh, good afternoon to everyone uh, present here. Uh, we are here to uh, discuss about Indian football and you know the roadmap ahead for the next decade. How we can uh, reach to you know where the tournament taking place in Qatar. How do we actually end up you know with this vision of ours since 1950 when we uh, you know supposedly made it to the world cup but we prioritized a different global event and couldn't get through so uh, first in the first episode we had mr ranjit bajaj uh, a very well known figure in the indian footballing circle uh, he had a lot of ideas to share about his mission it was his inception and uh, to follow it up we decided to talk to someone because mr bajaj has been mostly dealing in india you know, be it Minerva or Delhi FC, but we wanted to, you know, talk to someone from outside the Indian football ecosystem. And uh, uh, Sanjay sir, the director of the organization, he suggested uh, we speak to Mr. Sudesh S. Singh. Uh, as sir mentioned, he's the uh, director of the South African football uh, nations. But apart from that, you know, we will, of course, speak to him and try to understand from him his journey. But in short, if I have to tell you, uh, I can basically tell you that if you have heard of Ralph Ragnick, the European football uh, philosopher, I think for me, I think from what I've understood about him, he seems to be the you know same equivalent in Africa where he has you know worked with a lot of African uh, clubs and national teams and also in Vietnam, in Asia. So uh, before further delay, before any delays, uh, I would like to uh, bring on the uh, stage, the screen stage, uh, Mr. Sudesh Singh. And uh, sir, if you could, uh, first of all, sir, uh, thanks a lot for making it uh, to this uh, webinar. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, like any uh, normal interview also does, uh, if you could just tell us more about yourself to the audience, your journey, you know, in India, outside India, in Africa, and what are, what is it that you are currently focusing on when it comes to football? Thank you a lot, uh, Subham. Uh, firstly, I'd like to greet everyone on this platform and beyond. I think for me, obviously, it's 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 a huge privilege to be to be invited to to share a bit of my insights and experiences. Uh, obviously, I'm 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 based in South Africa, I'm born in Africa, but I have Indian heritage, as you can see. Uh, I was a former professional player, but I had to stop playing at an early age because I had a serious knee injury. And then I went into coaching. Uh, after that, via the South African Football Association, uh, a few of us were sent to study overseas. So I studied a bit in Holland, in Brazil, uh, in England. I did uh, one of the coaching licenses. This was way back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and then I started my coaching journey in, in local football in South Africa. Uh, and then I ventured abroad. I went to work in uh, Vietnam in the early 2000s. I came back to Africa. I worked around in Nigeria, Ghana, Zambia, Egypt, and uh, I'm currently back home in South Africa. At the moment, I'm the sports director of the South African Coaches Association. So we do a lot of uh, workshops, coaching courses, uh, upskilling other coaches and try to also do a lot of research uh, into modern coaching methodologies. Uh, we do a lot of case studies on international uh, success stories, you know. So basically football is my life, it's my passion and uh, I would really love to, 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 to add a little value to Indian football because uh, you guys should know better. I mean, you're one of the biggest countries in the world if, by now, if not the biggest country. And uh, India has always been popular for, for, for cricket in excellence. But uh, I believe there's a lot of, lot of talent in India. And, uh, you know, there's only one thing. When you look at international football, uh, the successful countries, there's only one way they achieve success, and that's by long-term planning. So I, I think if, if, if that's the way, if India wants to develop football to reach international level, it's got to be done on long-term planning. There's no shortcuts to success, you know. So basically, Subham, that's a bit about me. And uh, yeah, uh, let's hit the road running and, 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 and let's hear what else you want to talk about, Subham. Yes. 
uh sir uh, so my mind goes back to the uh, world cup basically this uh, world cup which south africa hosted back in 2010 and then we have uh, qatar hosting it this year but then uh, you know india has also hosted a couple of under 17 world cups but uh, what we see with qatar for example they performed poorly in the group stages but they actually won the asian cup you know in the asian cup before they you know after they hosting rights they have also played in the copa america they were one of the invites for the tournament south africa also did decently well in the tournament so what do you think is the scene with indian football to this is hosting the only way for us to get through or we can try to you know emulate what south africa and qatar did and maybe try to also go through the qualification route basically in the next yeah super i think that's a very interesting question and uh, as i mentioned previously you know you look at the history of the world cup there's only eight countries out of over 200 countries that have won the world cup and of that eight currently there's six or seven of them consistently challenged to win the world cup it's because they have a very strong football heritage and you know there's a lot of long term planning you mentioned briefly about qatar when you look when they won the 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 the, the bid to hold the world cup i think it was in 2010 uh they immediately had a long term plan in place the current team as you rightfully mentioned they played in the copa america they played in in the, they actually played in the Euro, european the uefa world cup qualifiers just to get experience there although the results were not taken uh they won the asian cup in 2019 but you look at the the planning and development behind that it goes way back for 10 12 15 years you know you look at the current coach who's there the spanish coach he's been in qatar for about 15 or 16 years uh majority of the team that played in 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 the current world cup they came up through the aspire academy you know nine or 10 or even more of those players were actually groomed at the aspire academy in, in qatar and that coach felix sanchez was actually their coach when they were kids so that just shows us without long term planning you will never achieve success you know so it's 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 got to be a long term project and when you look at football it works in cycles normally in four year cycles but to plan you got to look at between 8 to 12 years you look and that's the successful nations you look at the the, the case study of belgium the current team that they have they were put together about 12 or 16 years ago so it was a long term project I feel this is my personal feeling when I study the case they have a lot of very good individual players but I think they don't have a very solid philosophy that 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 integrates everyone successfully like what the Spain does or the Germany or the Brazil or France you know so so the starting point for any country you look at international case studies is to de- design and develop your own philosophy that will eventually give you a unique way of playing football you know the indian way of playing football but the important thing here where we make the mistake i've seen it happen in south africa i've seen it happen in other african countries i've seen it happen in asia in vietnam when i was there we bring in a lot of foreign influence foreign coaches and they come and they dilute our identity you know as either as africans or as asians there's a lot of thing we can learn the principles surrounding the game but the the training methodology must be designed around your own players because an indian player play in india you have a, a huge diversity from south india to north india east and west they all have their own characteristics so when you take a philosophy from any other country and just come and impose it on your players that philosophy is made for the dutch the spanish the german etc etc because they designed it around their own characteristics of their players so the starting point i would feel for indian football is to put together a, a team of experts not just coaches you need expert coaches deep thinkers of the game you need sports scientists you need sports experts and come together it takes a long time because you got to do a lot of research you got to do a lot of work into into who you are as as a nation what is the characteristics of your players what is the strength of your players what is the genetic makeup of your players you know those kind of things then you look at the environment what is our environment in 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 india in east west north south india what is the climate 
Is it high altitude? Is it sea level? Uh, what is the humidity level? All of those things, they, they, they contribute and they define what is your player. Then the other important thing is the diet and nutrition. What kind of food does a typical Indian player eat? Is it nutritious enough for high performance uh, requirements? So you need to do all of that. Once you sit, you, you look through all of that, you, you study who you are as an Indian football person, who, who, are, who are the majority of our players from East, West, North, South India? What are the characteristics? That's the starting point. So that takes a long time to study. It's not something you can put together a group of people within a month, two months, three months, you say, okay, we have an Indian philosophy. No, it takes years to do that. That's why currently there's very few countries in the world, especially now playing at the, low, uh, at the World Cup, that have a distinct and specific football philosophy. There's the few countries that have it are the ones who actually challenge to win the World Cup. And those are the countries we did case studies on, on how Germany won the 2014 World Cup. Uh, Brazil has won the, the, the World Cup five times. They favor us to win the game. But when you study the history of Brazilian football from way back in the 50s, what has influenced Brazilian football is, is actually, it, 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 it stretches back to 100 years previously, the slave trade from Africa. You look at the, the diversity of, of Brazilian uh, population. A lot of the football heritage comes from the African slavery heritage. So a lot of the players are of African heritage or mixed race heritage. You have the indigenous South American, the indigenous Brazilian Indian. So they have that mixture that gives them something special. That's why you find they're very creative, they're very skillful, they have a very good co coordination agility. When I look at briefly in, in, in the population of, of, of India, you have a diversity of, of, of different kind of people in India. The, the South Indian is vastly different from someone from North India. So, so those things need to be studied, but you need to embrace that diversity. Germany had to change the whole philosophy. We all knew pre-2000 what kind of football Germany played. They were very aggressive, very strong, very direct football. But they studied modern trends, how, how, how the game is changing in the world. And the world, the modern footballer, has to have very good technique. That's number one. Secondly, you've got to have a very sharp mind, a football brain, we call it in, in, in football language, where you can think very quickly on the field. You don't need to think only when you have the ball, what do I do? You have to think before the ball comes to you, what are my options? Because football is the most complex team sport. So, so, so Subham and, and everyone who's here, we, we got to look at it very deeply. We can't take it superficially or very simplistic, but no, let's just put together a plan and, 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 and let's hope we, India qualifies for 2030, you know? I mean, you only got seven years left. Is it realistic to say, let's try to qualify for 2030? Or should we put a longer term plan in place to say, let's try for 2034, either qualify or why not even bid to host the World Cup? If you bid to host the World Cup, it'll be great. I think India has a, has, has a great chance to host the World Cup. But then, don't just bid to host the World Cup. Also prepare a group of players, a, a pool of players, who are going to be developed over the next 8, 10, 12 years, so that they will eventually play at the World Cup. That's what we should be thinking. That's what, that's what Qatar did. When you look at the Qatar case study, the, the Qatar government actually were very, very smart because they are looking into the future. They looked in about 20 to 30 years' time, they would run out of their natural resource. What's bringing them there, they, 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 it's running the economy at the moment, is the, is the gas. So they know in 20 to 30 years' time, they will be out of gas. So how do they survive? What is the economy? And they decided sport, football. So they invested heavily in football to bring the World Cup there, to develop the infrastructure, the stadium. And I give you the example where South Africa didn't get it right. Because yes, we bid to win the World Cup. We hosted a very successful World Cup, lovely stadiums. But what we did not have was a strong technical plan. We just put together a team over four years. 
We brought a very good coach, experienced coach, and we expected magic, but you, you don't. So I think that's where South Africa lacked the long-term planning. You look at the successful nation, it's all about long-term planning. So from, from the case studies and the research and the studies we have done, without long-term planning, then you will never achieve success. You will never even try to qualify. So even the qualification route can be possible for Indian football because you must remember the next World Cups are going to be expanded to 48. So Asia might have maybe nine or ten spots. But currently, is Indian football strong enough to try for one of those, those extra spots? You are the guys who will tell me because you live in India, you're working in Indian football. Do you think realistically, in you can't even say it's eight years, seven years' time, 2030 World Cup, do you have the strength in Indian football? Because it's not only the talent pool, you also got to look at the backup. Do you have a system, a football ecosystem, your administration, your, your, your national competition system, your youth development system, your coach education system? Is all of that strong enough to, 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 to propel this put this group of uh, players to qualify for the for the 2030 World Cup. Those are the questions I think we should be asking ourselves. You know, so Subham, basically those are just in a nutshell what 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 my thoughts are around long term planning. You know. Yes. yes. I, I think you mentioned about uh, you know Qatar using you know sports as an alternative. I think especially football is being used as a soft power, you know, in many of the countries, especially the Middle East. And yeah, uh, in India, given the population, given the resources that we have, I think we should definitely look for a definitely look for a longer plan. You mentioned about the uh, failure of the you know South African. A dream of actually doing well in the World Cup, which did not happen. They of course scored the goal, Shabalala, but then then things went downhill from there. So talking specifically about your association, so what is the kind of football development ideology or the role that you know the South African Football Coaches Association takes up? So if you could just you know highlight it to the audience here. Yeah, I think it starts first with with the keyword as I told you. It's about designing a philosophy. And I think about five, six years ago, we did a lot of research and we designed what we felt is a South African football philosophy. Unfortunately, we are still in talks with the South African Football Association to implement it effectively, because also the South African and African problem is coach education. The coach education structures and, 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 and curriculum is very outdated because we always used to cut, copy, and paste from Europe. You know, we have a bit of Dutch methodologies, a bit of German, a bit of Spanish, English. So football shows you, you can't mix philosophies. You've got to have your own distinct philosophies designed around your own football culture in, in your country. So that's the research that we have been doing. And eventually we designed what we felt is a South African football philosophy. And we had to do extensive research and case studies. As I mentioned, the case studies included uh, Germany, how Germany won the 2014 World Cup, uh, Spain, France, uh, Brazil is obvious. But we didn't restrict it to football. We did case studies in, in other sports. What makes uh, Lewis Hamilton such a great uh, Formula One driver? What makes Tiger Woods such a great sportsman? Part of our research, surprisingly, I, I actually did a bit of study into why India is so good in cricket, you know. I did a case study why New Zealand are so good in rugby. So there are specific attributes to certain countries to excel in certain sports. But it's because of the nature of your players. Like in cricket, you look at how uh, majority of Indian players play cricket on gravel surfaces. So that gives them, and you look at the, the flexibility and, and, and the, of, of, of a typical Indian person, you know, the arms, legs movement is very flexible. So you find India used to dominate, obviously, with spin bowlers. India, South, South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. And then obviously with the batting on, on those surfaces. So 
your environment shapes who you are. So I would like, together with you guys going forward, to actually do more intensive studies and research into Indian football. We need to study the game scientifically. We can't just be taking off our head and say, I think this is what should happen, you know. It must be scientifically based. So it's, it's based on facts, not just uh, Suba me saying something or today she's saying something and that's how it should be. No, it must be done scientifically. And, 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 and that's what the research we did showed us, that if you don't adopt a modern scientific sort based uh, theories, then you'll never succeed. But it's good on one hand to do the theory and, and design lovely plans, you know, long-term plan. The key part is how do you implement that plan? That's what, that's what determines whether you fail or you succeed. So you design a philosophy, but the philosophy stands on two legs. The one leg is the coach education, the pedagogy. How do you then teach that philosophy to the coaches? And then the, the, the most important part is the training methodology. How do the coaches then implement? How do they train the players? So you look at modern football, it's all about thinking. So we should be look at developing coaches who can think critically. We need to think critically into the game, analyze the game in, in a very critical manner. So that when you coach players, especially young players, we are basically as coaches think, teaching players how to think. Because a player or human being is like a computer. It's the hardware, but what makes it work is the software. So the brain is what makes the whole body work. So football, modern football is now, you, you, they use an integrated concept. It's no more isolated training where we do passing for passing or running for running. They, so everything's integrated. You get the four performance factors. It's tactics, techniques, the mental aspect, and the conditioning aspect. So every exercise you design must include these four. You integrate it. You can still do passing, but do passing with movement. Do passing so that the player's brain is always activated and stimulated, you know. Because on the field, you as a coach, you can't control what the player does. But you must actually help him to have the solution stored in his mind. So when he's in the field, whatever challenge he comes up with, he can quickly analyze and assess and process the information that you have done in training. So modern training methods are very brain-centered very, very much brain-centered, because if you don't challenge the mind constantly, you will not have the solutions on the field. So that's what we had to design. We had to design a specific training methodology to train our players. And that's what we're currently doing from the grassroots level, because a philosophy, you cannot implement it from the top down. It must come from the bottom up. And that's why you look at successful nations and successful clubs in the world. The, the youth development system is very strong. So what we are doing currently with the South African Coaches Association, we are using what we call the pyramid, but we invert in the pyramid. Because normally the pyramid, we concentrate on national teams, professional football. So we are, we are, we are using this logo of inverting the pyramid whereby grassroots youth football should become priority because Without a strong foundation at youth level, at grassroots level, your national team, professional club, will never really have that talent pipeline coming through. So that the, the starting point should be the foundation. Have a very, very strong foundation at grassroots level. Have highly qualified coaches at grassroots level so that you develop players of the highest quality. Because you look at the, 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 the stages of development, it takes anywhere between seven to 12 years to develop a player fully to perform at the highest level. It's same like in human nature, you go to school when you are a kid, you go to primary school, you go to secondary school, and eventually if you can afford it, you go to university. Likewise with, 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 with the kid, because there's stages of development that you have to know as a coach. When they reach maturity, when they reach puberty, what are the growth spurts? So your training methodology must be designed around that. And it's important that the coach education curriculum must change. And this is what we're pushing for in South Africa and African football, is to change the coaching curriculum for coach education so that it becomes very specific to your region or your country or your, your region on the continent. You know? 
So that's very, very important. The starting point is the coach education. The coach education curriculum must be specific to your nature of, of, of football in your country, you know. So that's, that's the important thing, Subham, as I was telling you, that's what we are currently doing at the South African Football Coaches Association. Uh, yesterday, I just came from a three-day workshop in a, in a small village, a rural town, where we are trying to, to, to empower youth coaches. And most of them have never had any other formal coach education before. So we are trying to empower them to have a basic understanding of the game, you know, or deep, deeper understanding of the game, but relevant to South African culture, relevant to a South African player here. Yes, Subham. Sorry, your mic is off. Yeah. Sorry, sir. So I was just uh, telling about how this was great insight into the South African way of approaching coaching in football. So coming to Indian football from whatever you have been following, the very recent major development was the uh, change in the top tier football system wherein the uh, corporate-backed Indian Super League got the top tier tag, and then the Indian uh, Indian you know go down as the second tier, and then a lot of other things happen where the two biggest clubs in Indian football, in fact, globally, two very you know renowned clubs, they had to they eventually shifted to the corporate league. So uh, that all all those things aside, do you think the Indian football league system with all its junior leagues and the Durand Cups and everything is it? helping specifically the Indian Super League because it is now the official uh, top tier. Is it helping Indian football anyway from what you are seeing from your vantage point? I think as we mentioned earlier, you know, uh, it's, it's, about, it's about the pyramid, yes. And now you have the ISL at the top. But to everyone who's here, I can even ask you, what, what is in between? Is there strong structures in between? Do you have other junior leagues? Do you have regional junior leagues? Do you have a national under 17 tournament, a national under 20, a national under 15? So the whole system has to reflect what the philosophy is talking about, you know? So, so, so it's important that when you design a philosophy, you've got to also design a technical policy for the country. That technical policy, besides the youth development, besides the long-term plan to qualify for the World Cup, must also include how do you design the competition system in, the, in a country like in India? So now there's a lot of focus, a lot of resources put into the top league, which is the ISL, which is good. But do we have similar resources put at other levels into uh, the game? As I mentioned, grassroots football, youth football is fundamental. If you don't have a strong base, basis there, then even you can put billions of dollars into your top league it will never be successful for the national team. So I think when we talk about designing a national philosophy, a national technical policy for India, you're also going to look at, is our competition system currently in India conducive to developing players for our long-term aims? So that's a question I think we should be asking ourselves, especially there in India, to say, does our current national competition system, the way it's currently designed with the ISL, I'm not sure if you have a second division, a third division, and then lower leagues, amateur leagues, youth leagues. I, I, I don't have that much insight into Indian football. But the competition system must benefit the philosophy, the long-term vision. So even if it means changing the competition system around to suit the long-term vision and ambition of Indian football, then that should be done. Because now you have ISL clubs. I'm not sure if all of them have academies, fully fledged youth academies or high performance centers with every age group. Do they have that? So, when, do your ISL clubs or professional clubs have, have youth academies with all age groups? No, not all of them. So, most of them don't even have a residential academy. Yes, yes. You can actually. So, so when you look, when we did research and you studied the German model, when you look from the 2000s, when they, when they designed a new playing philosophy, 
They actually designed, redesigned the competition structure in the country. They had the Bundesliga, Bundesliga one, that's the second division. And part of the plan of the National German FA, every club, professional club had to have an academy, but the academy had to have certain structure, not one team, one new team or under 19. They had to have a whole string of new teams. But importantly, all the Bundesliga clubs and coaches, there was a unitary coaching methodology that the German FA uh, designed. So all the coaches in the country, all the clubs were using one curriculum. The only difference you would see at the highest level, individual coaches, say at Bayern Munich, Borussia Dortmund, the individual coaches, the difference would be on match day, how they tweak the tactics. But you would know when those players play together for the national team, they all played under one philosophy. They know what it is. The possession-based football, you're building from the back. That's how Manuel Noah became the best goalkeeper in the world because they changed their philosophy to build from the back. And to play possession football, you have to have exceptional technical abilities. You have to be very comfortable with the ball. But that only starts from youth level. You can't take a team now, say, playing in the ISL in India, and say, okay, we need to play, we need to build up from the back. Maybe those players have not been trained like that. The player is maybe 29 or 30 years old, playing now in the ISL. And he's not very technically gifted because he hasn't been trained that way. So you've got to train those players from a young age. The reason Messi became one of the best players is because he went to the best academy in the world at a very young age. So he came through a certain philosophy from the age of 10, 11, 12. He grew up in that philosophy of, of technical excellence, of playing possession, creativity, skill. And that's what the Germans did. They changed the game around. They decided, they, they studied the modern game and the future game. And they seen that skill and creativity is becoming a key mark. That's why today in modern football, the most valued players, the most expensive players, the most desired players are the most skillful players. The Messi's, the Neymar's, the Ronaldo's, uh, the Mbappe's. Those are the most expensive players because they, they bring something to the game. Remember, at the end of the day, football is another form of entertainment. So you must be able to play good football and win in football. That's the perfect package. And it's very difficult to do. You, we can talk about it, but how do you do it? That is why, as I said, there's only eight countries who won the World Cup. There's only about five or six countries who have a national philosophy. Australia is another case study we did recently. They designed their own national play philosophy in 2012. And now they are also starting to embrace the diversity in the country. There's a South African youngster who made his debut in this World Cup. He was actually, his parents are from South Africa, but they immigrated to Australia. There's an African player there, Deng, whose family comes from Sudan in East Africa. So, so it shows you how the world is evolving. But I believe India has a big enough population. You don't need to look for players outside. I believe you have enough players in India that just need to be developed in one way, the Indian way. So this is the challenge to Indian football, to Indian coaches out there. Can we get together? Can we design our own unique Indian way of playing football? That's the challenge I put to you. I'm here, I'm prepared to help, to, to guide, whatever. But most of the work has to be done by Indian coaches. Because another important part, you look at the World Cup, all these countries that won the World Cup, they've only won it with a local coach. They've never won it with a foreign coach. That's one of the reasons I feel when I studied uh, Belgium in this current World Cup, Belgium have a very, very talented group, but they're individuals. Plus they had a foreign coach. They had two foreign coaches because Thierry Andre is the assistant coach. So when you look at that, you have your national philosophy, but then you bring in a foreign coach to head the project. That foreign coach, as good as he is, he doesn't really know the culture of your own country. He might learn it over a period of time, but there are certain things he'll never know better than a local coach. So for Indian football, we have to develop good quality coaches. That's the starting point. Because if you want to achieve success at the international level, if you want to produce, develop high quality players for the international football, you've got to have good coaches. 
The starting point is the coaching. If we don't develop good coaches in India, then whatever plans you have, how much money you can throw at football and develop and even try to host the World Cup. But if you don't develop your own coaches, your own indigenous Indian coaches who know India, Indian players, Indian uh, environment, Indian food, Indian cultures better, they know it better than any foreign coach. Yes, there's a lot we can learn from foreign coaches because the principles of the game are, are universal. The principles are the same. The principles of training, the principles of defending, the principles of attacking, it's universal. But your training methodology must be specific to your, the nature of your players. The nature of your player in, in, in India will, 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 will advise you how to play the game. Because here I can ask some of the coaches a question. Do you think the typical Indian player is technically gifted? Do you think a possession-based style of play is suitable to English, uh, to Indian football? If someone can, can, can answer that question for me. Nidul uh, sir probably uh, would be the right person to answer this. So if you can... Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. What I am telling, I am really, uh, my, uh, your this, uh, session is very helpful because every time I was with the, all foreign coaches in the Indian team, but whenever I told them, yes, you should go through our philosophy, but they were introduced their philosophy. That was the problem in Indian team. And you know, when I, because I met uh, one coach, Mr. Colin Tor, he was very good, uh, he was good enough and he always respect our philosophy but later after whenever in any coach because you know mr sudesh you you you, you are just having the indian blood you know uh, everything of india and you know whenever a, a foreign coach is coming here money during his uh, money coming here he just always there within two three years the india will play world cup but when after the the, the money is uh, signing period when he is going to, we see the India is now still there, where in the uh, last four, uh, before four years, uh, India was there. So, so I am telling you frankly, whatever you say, because Indian ISL is running for nine years. I was in, I was in Delhi Dynamos in ISL, and after that I was in East Bengal also in ISL. But I, I, I in Delhi Dynamos, I told them, you start with the, uh, under 16, uh, sorry, under 10, under 13, under 16, and under 20, fourth generation. But you know, uh, nobody inter interested about the development phase. Nobody is uh, interested about the development uh, because they are interested about their ISL main team. Because uh, because if you if you, I, ISL main team is not help the uh, development of Indian football, what I believe. What I believe, the Indian, if we go for the development phase of under 13, under 15, under 17, and under 20, then only, then only we'll just, uh, these uh, groups will help the Indian football after four, five, six years. Because this is a problem in, in India. But uh, really, um, I uh, appreciate your session and whatever the uh, problem of Indian football, you just caught everything. Thank you. Thank you, Banerjee, sir. Uh, Subham, I also want to expand on what Mr. Banerjee said, because I think when you look at your ISL, we had uh, some coaches who worked in South Africa, foreign coaches, also coached ISL clubs. I think you know one of them was uh, Stuart Baxter. Baxter. I, 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 I can't remember which team he coached, but the English coach called Stuart Baxter. He even took a South African player, they called Alexander. But Stuart Baxter is one of those typical English coaches. He coached in South Africa, but he imposes his style of play, you know. He doesn't respect the nature of a South African player. He wants them to play a typical British style of play, you know. So it's coaches like that who come into a country and dilute your identity. But you'll get a few foreign coaches who do add value. One of the other coaches I worked with here in South Africa, a Spanish coach, at the club at Sundowns is, uh, and he coached in India was Antonio Habas. I think he's, he was at the, 
What club was it in Atletico uh, Kolkata? ATK, ATK, ATK. ATK in Kolkata. So he's, he's at least a bit of an open-minded coach. He respects the nature of, of the local players. But uh, some of the most, in my opinion, most of the foreign coaches, especially those who come from Europe, I've experienced the same thing in, when I was coaching in Vietnam. There were a lot of foreign coaches also. They don't respect the nature of the local player, you know, and the local culture. They take their mentality from Europe and they want to impose it without changing, without respecting the nature of, of, of your local football and the local player, you know. So this is where I have, I have deep sentiments similar to Mr. Banerjee and I respect that because if we don't unite as, as, as Indian coaches in India and, and say no, let's design our own philosophy, let's design our own training methodology because you guys know your players better than anyone else. So it's Indian coaches who must be uh, empowered. That's why coach education is so, so important. But then the most important thing is the content of the coach education. What are we teaching our coaches? Are we teaching them what? We are taking some bits from Holland, some bits from Germany, some bits from Spain and putting it together. Here in uh, South Africa, we call that a, a mixed masala kind of thing, you know, where you mix everything together and then you expect, you can't. You look at the countries that win the World Cup, the countries and clubs that achieve success, they have a very, very distinct philosophy, very pure ideology that is based on their nature, that is based on their culture, the environment, the weather, all those things. And this is what we have to design and teach the Indian coaches, because then the Indian coaches will be able to develop these youngsters up to international level. So that's where it starts. The coach education is critical, critical factor for Indian football. And I wish, and it's good that a group like Idea Sports Management Group is starting to roll out uh, coach education programs. And that is critical aspect, you know, even if you start projects in different states, that's slowly because India is, is a huge country, it's a huge country. So if you start individual projects, different states, and build up from the ground upwards organically, that's the only way you go. Because if we're going to focus on ISL clubs only, as Mr. Banerjee said, and you guys know, every ISL club only has one or two or three age groups. They don't worry about the others. So that you're looking at, if I give you an example, uh, say like uh, Mumbai City, maybe they have three or four age groups. That's how many players? 30 per team. What about the millions, the thousands of other young kids left out there? So, so, so the grassroots is, 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 is so, so important. But more important than that is to educate the coaches. The coaches must be empowered, upskilled, and educated with relevant modern uh, coaching methodology. But the coaching methodology that is suitable to Indian football, we cannot take from one country and impose it on another country. It won't work like that. It's like in India, if you eat, normally you eat in uh, dal or rice or roti, now all of a sudden I tell you to eat pasta every day. You won't, you won't make it. You can eat that once or twice. But if I tell you eat pasta every day, eat uh, lasagna every day, eat pizza every day, your stomach, you'll get sick because that's not what your, your body is used to. You know your own food, you know. So why must football be different? So we need to find our identity first as Indian football. Who are we as Indian football? Because Mr. Banerjee was a great player in his days there. In the 50s, 60s, even going back to the 40s, India was a powerhouse in football. Didn't you win the, the, the African, the, the Asian championship, I think, also, or reach the finals in the 50s or 60s? So there was a lot of talent. So you can't say now, that there's no talent in Indian football, when you already have a history of, of playing at the highest level. So it just needs to uh, rethink, to get everyone together, leave aside our petty egos, jealousies, all of those, and let's unite for the sake of Indian football. Because if you are not united, you won't achieve anything, you know. And that's not just in football, that's life generally in society. So we need to first unite, and the only thing that can unite Indian football is to have a philosophy. Because the philosophy is like a constitution of a country. It provides a framework of how do you, how do you operate, how do we want to play football, how do we train our coaches. 
and what kind of competitions we design in, 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 in Indian football, you know. So the, the philosophy is very important because that will be your roadmap. It's like in business, when you open a business, you design a business plan, you do SWOT analysis, and constantly you evaluate to say, okay, I'm not making so much money profit in my business, why? Is my, is my product too expensive? Or is it the target market is different? Or what? So you constantly evaluate. That's how football is. Likewise, when you develop players, you've got to constantly evaluate and monitor the progress of the players. Aligned to that, we have to develop the, the, the coaches. So it's a parallel structure. You development, coach development. Because if you don't develop coaches constantly, you will never develop quality players. You know. Yes, as I was mentioning that uh, France, uh, it plays in nine minutes and we have uh, Didier Deschamps who is basically also a player and also the coach of the, was also the player when in uh, France won the World Cup in 98 and now he's coaching. So I think the indigenous mentality of coaching really comes into play and helps the, you know, type of football that needs to be played. Rightly pointed yes. out, sir. So uh, we also have Mr. Sham Manik Lord uh, on the call here. Uh, he's a very distinguished Indian uh, coach uh, who has trained a lot of footballers, you know, right from the lower levels to the higher equions. So, sir, uh, I, if, if possible for sir, sir, could you also, uh, Sham, sir, if you could also highlight the uh, Indian coaching methodology and uh, help uh, Mr. Sudesh understand how it functions here, basically. Uh, thank you, Shubham. Am I audible? Say audible. Okay, it's a, it's a nice session uh, by the Sudesh. Sudesh. Uh, whatever the nice to meet you, sir. Benarji, it it's actually a really it's a reality thing that the Indian philosophy has to be followed, not the foreign philosophy. We have to understand the culture, and everything has to be the whatever the country is followed. Without understanding the country culture, you cannot develop the your own philosophy. Otherwise. Whatever the Indian football is have a lacking, that is the drawbacks. Foreign coaches are coming, they try to implement their own philosophy, that is the drawbacks. So, he rightly said the middle Banerjee that he was working with a lot of the uh, foreign coaches. So, he rightly said that you must understand the country philosophy, then only you can develop the other thing. So, it is very, very informative session by the Sudesh was telling whatever the things are the development of Indian football for the future. So thank you very much for this good session. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, uh, coming back to uh, Sudesh, sir. So a uh, uh, few years back, I remember uh, following the Indian ranking globally. And I was astounded to find out that India was 32nd in Asia. So if there was a World Cup for Asia, then we barely make it. So that was our condition back then, few years back. We have, of course, improved a bit. So, but uh, what do you think will, what is it required for us to make it to the top 10 or the top 5 in Asian football, like how Qatar won the World Cup, for whatever reasons it might have been. And then try to, like how you mentioned, uh, Mission 2030 is very unrealistic, but then we can always target a 34 or a 38 without really going for the hosting bit. So where do you see us, you know, improving in the Asian front first and then trying to reach the global milestone? Yeah, Subham, I think that's a good question, you know, and uh, it comes back to what all of us have been talking here. Without a long-term plan in place, we will never, even 2030, it might seem impossible, but in seven years, you could still do something if the whole country unites behind a certain project. I still feel you could start if you start next year having youth academies in every state you start with a group of 15 16 year old you scout the best talent in each state bring them to one center a group of 40 50 players and you have that all over the country so you have a pool of two three four hundred players all over the country it may be 15 16 year old you have some of the best local coaches youth coaches working in those academies and all coaching and playing under one philosophy, Indian philosophy. And for the next seven, eight, nine, 10, 12 years, you will definitely achieve success. And what should happen also in between all of this, you've got to play friendly games against other countries from other continents also. 
so that the players get to feel what is it, what, what is it like playing against an African country? What is it like playing against a South American country? What is it like playing against a country from Europe? So, because those are all different kinds of styles of play. And in Asia itself, how do you match up? Because you know the top countries there, Japan, Korea. One of the, interestingly, before I forget, one of the case studies I did when we designed our philosophy and when I worked in Vietnam, because I wanted to see in Asian football, obviously, what's making certain countries successful. And the best case study I did was on Japan. And you'll be surprised to know, this was about 10 years ago when I was in Vietnam, uh, when I did this case study. The, the Japanese have two philosophies. The, because in football, there's two philosophies. You're playing football, your playing philosophy, which will give you your style of play. And then your philosophy overall, your vision of where you want to go. So Japan has two philosophies, a 50-year philosophy and a 100-year philosophy. So imagine, let that, let's think about that for a, for a minute. Two philosophies, a 50-year uh, philosophy, a vision, and a 100-year vision. So the people who design these visions will not even be living to see it happen. But that is what futuristic thinking is. And look at the performance of, of Japan. When I was in Vietnam, the under-23 Japanese team played in a tournament there. there. And I was speaking to the Japanese coach. He's also a lecturer at the, at the university. So he was telling me one of the shortcomings of the Japanese national team in previous World Cup was because they had, they had good players, un, un, undoubtedly. The problem was they had a foreign coach all the time. But look at this World Cup. They have a local coach, and that coach was a great player. So he's a former good player who's now the head coach of the national team. And look how they're achieving. So that is, those are the, the little secrets that we, we, we tend to overlook. You have your great local players, like Mr. Banerjee and others. So why don't we take them and empower them as, as coaches? Because once you are a good player, you have the upper hand in becoming a good coach. Because you know the game, you've played the game. You know what is the dynamics in players' minds. You know how, what happens in the dressing room. You know what happens when players are together. So the best coaches, I'm not saying that others who never play the game cannot become good coaches. No, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying the ones who have the potential to become truly great coaches are the ones who play the game. You look at Pep Guardiola, you look at Zidane, you look at Didier Deschamps. So those are the ones who play the game. They understand the dynamics of the field because they were players, and they understand the dynamics on the field because on the field, there's so many dynamics that happen on the field. You've got to think of the weather, the sun, the rain. You've got to think of the surface. You've got to think of the opponent. You've got to think of where the ball is. You've got to think of the space, all in a split second. So if you, your mind is not sharp, you will never be successful. So for Indian football, we've got to look at that. Look at our own people first. Look at your former players. Look at your coaches. Even these modern scientific coaches, the coaches who go to university to study. Let's see how you integrate. That was when, when the study into German football, we did the case study. That's one of the interesting facts we, we, we found out that one of the tricks is how do we integrate in Germany their former players into coaching plus those who never played professional football but went to study at university. That's why you'll have a coach like uh, uh, Nagelsmann, Julian Nagelsmann at, at Bayern Munich. He's young, he's dynamic, but he's very futuristic, he's, he's good. But you'll also have your, your former players like Hansi Flick and others that we mentioned, you know. So you've got to see how do you integrate that. So your coach education, your coaches are the most impact, important factor. And that's the starting point. But coming back to, to 2030, I don't feel it's impossible. It can only be impossible if you don't work together. Yes, the ranking of the Indian national team is low, but I believe you have the raw national talent in India. You have the coaches who, who are hungry to succeed and want to do that. So all you need is the support from the officials. All you need is the resources, because you look at Qatar, the government put in billions of dollars behind their football. The Aspire Academy is world class. It's the best in the world because they put a lot of money into it. So we've got to ask ourselves a question. Will the Indian government, will the Indian corporate world come into football like what they have put money into the ISL, into cricket, 
would they put similar money into football, Indian football? Because these days, to achieve success, it takes money. If you don't have money, you're going to stay behind. And that's what transformed Japan. The, the government put a lot of money into, into, into Japanese football. And hence, they designed these visions, the 50-year vision, the 100-year vision. In these visions, they already achieved some of the targets that they set. They wanted to win one of the World Cups. The ladies' team won the World Cup. They wanted to host the World Cup. They hosted the 2002 World Cup in South Korea. So they've already achieved some of the targets they, they set. The other part of the, 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 the vision was also to develop the game at grassroots level, to have more people playing the game, to have more people supporting, watching the game. So those were also part of the, the visions and the philosophy. So Indian football, yes, I'm glad maybe this forum is happening and others a lot are talking in Indian football because the World Cup is happening, but it shouldn't be just a talk show now and after the World Cup, everything is forgotten and people go back to, to, to what they were doing, you know. Let's look at 2030, let's look at 2034 and beyond. It shouldn't stop there. It should go on into the future, the next 50 or 100 years. But the targets should be 2030, 2034 for now. An 8 to 12 year plan should be put in place and the work should start happening. And that's urgent work because we've already lost one year. 2022 World Cup is almost finished. The next 2026 is three years away. So you look at the, 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 the Spanish, they have the second youngest team playing at this World Cup, the Spain and USA. But the Spanish team at this World Cup, they're not expecting to achieve anything. They, they, they're training and developing this group of players to win the next World Cup. And you look at the group of youngsters, they, this is another encouraging part about Spanish football and modern football. They are, they, are, they are not scared to play young players. They've got 17-year-old, 18-year-old, 19-year-old players playing there. So, so, so see how brave they are, because they are planning to not just compete at 2026 World Cup, but to win 2026 World Cup. And with this current group of players, they have a very good chance of doing that. So when you talk about India 2030, I would not say it's, it's impossible. Because in life, as we all know, nothing is impossible. But it's what, should, what will make it impossible if we don't unify and have one vision and, and work towards that goal. So those are my thoughts. Thanks a lot, Subham. Yes, sir. Uh, so rightly put, sir. Uh, you mentioned about uh, you know players from the same country coaching. So we had uh, Robbie Fowler, one of Liverpool's greatest. He was managing East Bengal, one of our biggest clubs. But then that did not work out, you know, to the extent we wanted to. So we know the benefits. We have already discussed the benefits of having indigenous managers. Uh, but uh, what are the benefits, according to you, of having a foreign manager on board? And so hypothetically, if you were given a chance to, you know, take on the mantle of managing any club or team in India, you know, as a manager or as a in a consultant like how Ralph Ragnar has developed himself. So what are the changes or what are the immediate uh, changes that would like to bring to the Indian football of, way of playing the city? I think Subham is very important for any foreign coach. And I experienced it when I worked in Vietnam. I cannot impose myself. I'm the one who must change to adapt to the, to the local culture. And that's the important thing what foreign coaches don't do. They want the local people to adapt to their way. And it should be the other way around, because I am the foreigner. When I went to Vietnam, I'm the foreigner. I must learn about their language, their culture, their players, and adapt accordingly. And if you are a, a smart or futuristic, uh, brave coach, you have to adapt. You can't say, this is how I coached in England, or this is how I coach in Holland. Now I must coach the same way in, in India, because the Indian player is different from the player in Holland. So I think this is where the, 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 the problem comes about where a lot with foreign coaches. They don't want to adapt to the local environment. So I think with Indian football, if, if for, say for me, an example, I would have to learn the Indian culture as much as I'm Indian, but I'm more based in Africa. But I would have to learn the nature of the Indian player, the average, the typical Indian player. What are his strengths? What's his weaknesses? What, what, what is he good at? And then design my style of play around the players. I can't tell the players when I come there, this is how I want you to play. 
because they might not be able to play like that. It's not in their nature. So I need to learn what is the nature of a typical Indian player. And I have to quickly learn, assess, look at them in training, what are their attributes, what are their strengths, and then design a style, a team style. How do I coach this team? How do I want them to play uh, the games? And that's how it is, basically. So it's very important that when a coach, I'm not saying all foreign coaches are bad. There are some coaches, very few, unfortunately, who adapt to the local culture, the local style of play, the local player, and just modernize it, just lift the levels of professionalism, the training done at a higher intensity, using more modern training methods. Those are the things that you change, you just slight changes. But also the foreign coach must be able to work with the local coaches. It shouldn't be a case of isolated. I had this the same uh, problem in Vietnam where some of the local coaches I worked with, they felt threatened and then they sabotage you behind the scene, you know. So it's, it's, it's a very tricky situation. It has to be trust, but the foreign coach is the one to extend his hand to make the relationship work with the local coaches. Because if you can't work with the local coaches as a foreign coach, you are going to be doomed. You, you, you will not succeed. So you have to respect the local coach because he's the one who's going to help you and give you more insight into the local player, into the local game. So the relationship you have to establish as a foreign coach, the first thing you have to do, establish a good relationship with the local coaches so that you don't have this animosity between each other. You don't feel insecure. And it will help you as, as, as a foreign coach because the local coach will give you advice and assistance that you don't know because he knows his environment better than me, you know. Yes, sir. This uh, reminds me of uh, Ted Lasso and then how, you know, from the American setup, he goes to manage an English club and adapts to the English way of living, you know, despite the differences between the two. Uh, sir, you mentioned about uh, the Japanese philosophy of playing or the Australian philosophy. So we have seen uh, Japan, South Korea, Australia, them being extremely successful, be it making it to the European football system, you know, through different clubs or they themselves being very strong as a team. We have seen how Japan have defeated two world champions, you know, of we have they have in total defended five world champions, four from Germany and one from Spain. So, so uh, do you think there are some qualities we can uh, look to emulate the Indian football system where we try to take some of the philosophies, some of the systems that these countries have in play in Asia? Absolutely, Subham, because we learn, we learn from others. But what we must not do is take what they are doing and just use it without knowing why. But if we learn about the principles and what are the modern trends, that's what we should learn from others. So we should, we should study closely why are the Japanese so successful? What are they doing right? So that gives you the whole overall framework. But then you take that and you design it according to your own nature, Indian football. What is good for Indian football? Do we need, say like a simple thing of what should be the style of play in Indian football? Should we play possession-based football? Should we have patient build up from the back? Should we have interpassing combination? Should we, do we have skillful and creative players in Indian football? I believe you have. Are they used correctly? Are we, are we patient? Are we supportive? Or do we just want players who run 90 minutes up and down, you know, workhorse type of player? So I believe in Indian football, you do have skill, creativity, because I see it in the cricket team. So those are Indian players. They are Indian people. So I'm sure in Indian football, you also have creative players. You look at the way modern football is now, even the goalkeepers uh, start playing the ball from the back with their feet. So the, the, the goalkeeper starts becoming a playmaker from the back. So that's how modern football is, is evolving. Another feature of modern football is the players are becoming more multifunctional. They are not fixed in the position. They can play two or three different positions. They can attack, they can defend. And those are the important things. So do we have those kind of players in India, or do we have players with that potential to be developed, to be multifunctional? You look at the Brazilian team, a lot of those players are your traditional number 10 playmakers, but they all play together the way the coach uses them. So modern football is all about skill, about creativity, about movement. 
And I believe you have the talent in India. The coaches here will agree with that also. So, so yes, we learn from other countries what are the principles, what, what they're doing right. But then we take from there and we see how do we shape the Indian football? How do we adapt it to fit into our Indian football culture? And that's how, what, what the thinking should be. Yes, I think very rightly pointed out, sir. Yesterday itself, we saw Netherlands, I mean, Louis Van Aal, with all his cancer issues and all of it, you know, the World Cup comes and they, the Federation knows that they need a legend from their own country to come in and, you know, manage. And of course, you mentioned about a multifaceted player. They have Daily Blind who can play virtually anywhere around the, you know, midfield or defence. He can play as a wing back or a full back or a midfielder. You know, a lot of facilities that he can provide to the playing eleven. So, sir, all in all, sir, very in insightful session, you know, with you. Uh, before we close the session with uh, two, three other questions, sir, what is your message uh, in general to the Indian football population present here? We'll, of course, be sending the recording to the general public too. So, what is the message from the African vantage point? You know, the football is growing very rapidly there, be it North Africa, Tunisia, Morocco, or the you know, other parts of Africa. So what would be your message to be to the Indian subcontinent? And where do we see ourselves in the next decade? I think for me, it's, it's very simple that we need to have a passion for the game. You look at the countries that you mentioned, all the, the, the general population, the public, the fans, they are very passionate about the game. That's why football is the number one sport in the world. So I'm not saying that, no, let's forget about cricket, but the public need to embrace football. They need to support football. They need to be excited. I know we get very excited about English football or La Liga or whatever. Let's get excited about Indian football. Let's support Indian football. From the grassroots on, we need to be passionate about the game. We need to be excited. I, I, I managed to watch some of the under-17 uh, Women's World Cup in, uh, games on, on TV. And I've seen the excitement, the passion of the people, the fans who came to watch the game. So the passion is there, but it needs to, to be a huge uprising from the ground, ground up so that the government can see how passionate Indians are about football. Because there's a perception around the world that, no, Indians can't play football, you know, at a high level. So we need to change that paradigm. We need to change that, that mentality to say, we can play football. We, India can play in the World Cup. Who would have thought that, that, that countries like Qatar, Saudi Arabia would play the World Cup? But they are playing in the World Cup. So that's what makes football so beautiful. It, anyone can play football. So India is one of the most populous countries in the world. India must be playing in the World Cup. China should be playing in the World Cup. It's countries like this because you have a huge population. So the passion needs to be reignited in Indian football from the ground up. The passion for the game. If the passion is there, half the battle is won already. Uh, so I think the defining words from your uh, statements were anyone can play football, basically. And that is where we need to basically channelize all our efforts. Uh, we have a couple of people raising their hands. Fabio, That's Anthony, one. if you are on the talk, would you like to talk? And also Sham, sir. Yeah. You could, yeah. Uh, Shivam, I think it is a, it is a too early for uh, 2030 of India will be play for World Cup. It's a too early, as the Mr. Sudesh already mentioned that the, we have to follow the Japan. What they have uh, they did, they have took the uh, vision to a uh, World Cup. It is decided in the 2000, and and they has to be decided that the 2050 they will be world champion, and by 2040 they will be the world top 10. Before that, this project they has to reach us all through goes that the, they are where the lacking uh, between the world standard team like uh, German, Brazil, German, and others. Where is the lacking? We are lacking in the genetic. We are lacking in the food style habits. We are lacking in the style of play. Where in the uh, genetic? Where the we are lacking? The, first of all, sort out with the what is the difference between the world standard and the awards. Then they have decided their project and took the project for 50 years. It's a long project is required. 2030, a World Cup playing is a very too early for India. As Japan was working like this, and by the 20 years, they almost reached their World Cup vision. 
and that's why they are playing very nicely in those World Cup. They are uh, they are playing excellent their performances. So you say need a long period, and the most thing we are discussing about the thing. But for for first most thing that Indian Football Federation, the people those who are the sitting, they have to take the long term planning with the good coaches thinking about this project. Then only it can reach it. Otherwise, we are discussing on this platform, but it will be nothing as is told. Uh, this World Cup is going on. Everything, everything is going on. The charges like this to discussing about this. After that, all will go to the deep sleep. Again, the, when when World Cup will come, then question will be arise: Why India not able to play? Being a one one point four million people are there, so it is need a long term planning. And mostly the Indian coaches have to be developed. Not only the foreign coaches come and go; they will be come for their purpose, but. Federation has to be take the decision, long term plan to build up from the grassroots, and then will be after 20 years or 30 years you can think of that the India will play the World Cup. Very rightly mentioned by the Sudhas that the Japanese philosophy they have to develop. When they started the J League, in that then only they bring the lot of good coaches from the world famous coaches like Jiku and others. Then they gradually, gradually now where they reach we can see. So hope that. India, the Indian Football Federation has to take this decision for the long term basis. Uh, it's a very, very thank you for the Mr. Sudesh to highlighted all the things relatively very nicely. So I think it is a too early in 230 will be India play. It is very well. Let's hope that we'll do that. Yes, sir. I point out, can I? Uh, I need to see. May I ask? Yeah, yeah sure, go ahead. Uh, sir, you have been residing in South Africa for a long time now, and you are also working on the development of South African football. So, but uh, we haven't really seen much of uh, South Africa since the 2008 World Cup, which they hosted, obviously. So, what do you think is not going right for them in terms of the development and whatever? But uh, I guess they have many talented players, but they aren't able to showcase uh, in the Tournaments. What do what do you think about it? Yeah, that's a good uh, question, Fabio. I think the problem is what we are talking about here is the lack of a national philosophy. If you don't have a philosophy and implement a philosophy from the grassroots levels up, you will have these gaps in development. Because when I, uh, I spoke earlier, I say it takes between seven to twelve years to develop a, foot, uh, a player to the highest levels or to play at the highest levels. So you can't take a player three or four years, uh, give him a bit of coaching and then expect him to play in Europe or play for the national team. You've got to go through the full scale of the development. And I think that's also a challenge in South African football and Africa as a whole. One of the countries that is very progressive minded in African football is Morocco. Morocco has got a long-term plan in place, and you can see how their football they're achieving. Not just the team that is playing in the current World Cup. You look at the ladies' team. The ladies' team recently, they lost to South Africa in the final of the African Championship. So they have a long-term plan in place. So without having a long-term plan, without having well-equipped, well-knowledgeable, well-qualified coaches, you won't be achieving those things. So that's one of the struggles, the challenges we also have in South African football. South African football has a lot of natural raw talent. Under the age of 12, 13, going downwards, we have exceptional talent. But the problem is also we are, our coaches are not equipped to, to, to coach well at that level because the, the quality of the education system in South Africa is not good enough. We also used to do what you guys are doing in India, where we copy too much what other countries are doing in Europe. There were a lot of foreign coaches coming into South African football, and that also dilutes the identity of South Africans. So these are the challenges we have in South African football. We are trying to slowly unite coaches, unite people in, in the football ecosystem. But as you all know, it's very, very challenging in football to bring everyone together and make everyone drive forward in one unified vision, you know. Right, actually point out. Kalyan, if you have anything to speak, you can quickly do that. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I completely agree with the uh, other person who said that India doesn't ready for 2013. 
I in my personal view, I think uh, those who are going to take India to World Cup, I I don't think they do, didn't even born now. We have to set up a system who are going to born and uh, develop from their childhood only. I think uh, here what happening is like there is there is examination is going on, but there is no preparation. I mean, India hosting a under 17 men's World Cup, women's World Cup, but their players don't have any youth league. They directly come from their schools. Uh, recently, in January, uh, two months ago, we have a under 17 women's uh, World Cup. Those girls are all from the schools. They don't play any game any, for any club. They don't have any contract. They're directly taken from their schools and put in a FIFA World Cup. And they get be, uh, beaten by easily by uh, seven goals, eight goals by uh, European countries. But there is no system. Like you said before, we don't not only have to educate <coughs> co coaches, we have to educate pe people. I mean, there is many people don't know how the fan culture works, how you have to behave with the away, away fans when the away fans are coming to your stadium. How you have to, uh, we have to educate a lot of sports, I mean, parts, uh, administration, players, coaches, fans. The culture is not uh, educated completely in a very base level. Right, right. Rightly pointed out, Kalyan. Uh, so uh, we are coming to the uh, closing phase of the session. So uh, before I close, uh, I need to uh, mention about ideas, uh, you know, unlimited sports management group. So uh, since its inception in uh, 2007, uh, ideas has taken up a lot of initiatives for Indian football you know, from the grassroots level to also, you know, hosting award shows where we felicitate a lot of the achievers. We have also done a lot of coaching, uh, training, education camps. Sham sir he has been a part, a very integral part of all of that. And uh, we, apart from that, uh, before I hand it over to uh, Sanjay sir, who also wants to speak about the mission 2030, I would uh, want to uh, ask Sudesh sir a question about it. and. Uh, before that, I'll definitely quickly uh, thank all the uh, sponsors, uh, Bodyline, uh, ARC, Infotech, Vertiv, uh, Vyom, CSDA, and our radio partner, Big FM. Uh, so, sir, uh, final question to you before I hand over the mic to Sanjay, sir. Uh, there has been an MOU signed between Ideas and your uh, association, the South African Football Coaches Association. So where do you see uh, the MOU, you know, st with the inception of the MOU, the, the paperwork being done, where do you see this collaboration between two countries which aim to develop a lot in football? We are all, you know, economic powers, of course, we are part of the BRICS or the all the emerging superpowers that we, you know, like to call ourselves. So, but where do you see ourselves in football and where do you see the collaboration between ideas and your organization helping us to reach that phase, basically? Thanks, Subham. I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very exciting venture that uh, Sanjay has, has discussed with myself and I discussed it with my uh, management of the association because we would love to, it is not only for us to try to help you, but we also need to learn. There's a lot of things we can learn from Indian football, you know. Uh, so it's, it's, it's an exchange of ideas. So if there's a need where we can help, we surely do that. We have similar arrangements with uh, other football organizations around Africa. Uh, as I said recently, I was doing some work in Botswana. Uh, I was consulting on, on developing a high performance project, an academy for the football association there, you know. So, uh, these kind of relationships. And for me, uh, Indian football is very close to my heart. Obviously, I have Indian heritage, you know. So. If when, when I was approached by Sanjay, I, I, I didn't think twice about it, you know. Uh, so we are available to help. I discussed it with my colleagues. They also excited, they're willing to do anything we can to help because football is special. This is what makes the world, the whole world comes together. So we can't work in little silos and keep things to ourselves, you know. We, we share, we learn from each other all the time. So for me, it's a privilege and uh, and it's an exciting arrangement uh, between Idea Sports Management Group and, and, and my coaches association, you know, in South Africa. 
Yes, sir. So, thank you so much for you know enlightening everyone. Uh, Sanjay sir, would you uh, would like to you know take the final words for this session? Thanks. The mic. Yeah. No, you muted. That, that. Sir, please turn on your mic. Yes. Uh, I can't hear you on this side. So you're not audible. Sir, still we can't uh, hear you, sir. Um. <coughs> I think uh, then, sir is having some uh, technical difficulties. Uh, we'll just... Yeah. No, sir, we can't. There are some um, wild issue. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, we can't. Uh, so, no problem, sir. We... Yeah. Yeah, try now. Yes, Sanjay, try it now. Shubham, do you want to say something? Yes, sir. Uh, Mithul, sir, would you like to add something before sir, Sanjay sir tries to figure out mm. this issue? No, I don't want to add. Yes, I like to say that uh, thank you, Sanjay, thank you, Shubham for affirming me the opportunity to join this uh, valuable session. And thank you, Mr. Shudesh, because uh, your your opinion is just like my, my opinion because i have tried so many times because you know last year i was in east bengal we have a player uh, that is chuku chama his philosophy his uh, nation's philosophy is different and we uh, the coach came from the spain i uh, told that uh, spanish coach that he is always habituated to play with a double striker double striker he always played with a double striker you don't put him in a single striker then he will not show anything Later on, he just shifted to, he transferred to uh, Jamshedpur and uh, the coach uh, put him with double striker and he scored so many goals. Just in the same year, he was in East Bengal, he uh, can't able to score. But later on, he, when he joined the uh, Jamshedpur, he scored four or five goals. <laughs> so this is the problem here. And thank you very much, Mr. Sudesh, because I joined so many sessions, so many sessions uh, during the last two, three years. But I am really, really, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, because uh, you, you know, uh, told everything. You expressed everything which which is needed for Indian football. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Indeed, sir. I think all of us who have attended here, I think, would echo what Mr. Midun said, you know. Even I, you know, sir, as a young sports management professional, I learned a lot. A lot of things which I had no clue about, you know, the ideas that you shared. And so we'll definitely want to, you know, collaborate with you on a longer scale. We'll definitely get you for more sessions. So this was just a one hour session because the World Cup is in play and everyone wants to watch the match. Yeah. Too, but we'll definitely get you after the World okay. Cup when everyone is free and we'll do a much longer session. And, you know, we'll put in a lot more other things so that, you know, we can have a proper session where coaches come and you know discuss their ideas with you as well we brainstorm a lot of ideas thank you thank you Sanjay. Subha. thanks to sanjay and, and thanks to all the coaches on this platform you know it has really been a nice session and i enjoyed it and thanks again for the invitation yes sir. So sanjay sir uh, so could you try a uh, last one more time if it's possible to you uh, uh, no no it's not coming here no problem, sir. We'll uh, definitely uh, maybe strike up a okay. one more one more conversation, or we'll, we'll definitely pass on the message to you. You know, from sir. All right.
thanks sir. yeah thank you so much yeah thank you so much everyone for you know thank being you. present thank you sudesh sir thanks sir sham sir all the other people are present and yeah let's go back to what we were discussing let's go back to the world cup that is taking place france versus poland and uh, until next time thank you so much good night okay okay thank you thank very you. much thank, thank you. you thank you
टाटा सर